read lecture. Um, and this is entitled Universal Gravitation. If you're not done with Unit 2, that's your week weekend homework, of course. You like to make sure that we can uh, come back and ready to go. Just check and double check in our calendar. Uh, we're going to uh, come back and we're going to make sure that we have one, two, three work days. It's going to go pretty quick. The activities are pretty short. Uh, materials due on Wednesday at the end of school. Test is on uh, Thursday and on Friday. So make us a good day. We're going to go out and drop our parachutes, have a good time, get our discovery for the next one. Okay? Any questions about that? All right, good. Let's go ahead and do um, a little bit about this, this unit. As I said, it's called universal gravitation. And I love this unit because it is a, uh, it's really, really, really far out there. And when I say that, what I mean is, is that we're going to be talking about gravitational forces that aren't just here on Earth, but things that affect Earth and things that are out in outer space. And what if, what if sort of things. You know, we can't take a field trip, but, but that's the way it goes. Um, I want to start off with a little history. And um, there was a really, really famous scientist named Tycho Brahe, who was a, uh, an astronomer. Um, uh, at, the, at the time, he probably did, you, know, you might have called him a physicist, but, but really what we would call him now is an astronomer who made very, very accurate measurements, OK? Um, he was very well known for um, staying up all night and looking at the stars and measuring things. And uh, he, he developed some systems which uh, proved to be very, very, very useful uh, to the scientific community. So, so Tycho Brahe did a lot of, of measuring throughout the course of his lifetime. But he ended up not doing very much with it, um, which is kind of interesting. Because you know, in science, sometimes we say, well, we got these famous people like so-and-so and so-and-so. And -so and, and, but then there's lots of other people who do a lot of groundwork. Well, along came one of his assistants. His name was Johannes Kepler. And Kepler helped um, Brahe take a lot of this data. But Kepler was probably a little bit more intuitive, a little bit, maybe a little more intelligent, whatever. He was able to put together the <laughs> ideas into scientific principles, into scientific thought. Okay? And so what Kepler was able to do was to take all of this data and um, be able to mathematically analyze the information and to come up with some pretty cool ideas. Now, most of you, before coming into physics, knew of Newton's three laws, or at least have heard of Newton's three laws. My, my daughter's in fifth grade, and they're talking about Newton's three laws. So we know that uh, Newton was a very famous scientist, of course, with calculus, etc. But Kepler is also pretty famous for his three laws, OK? And um, we have a better three there. So I want to talk about those today. And the first thing I want to do is take the paper, the discovery that you have that has the holes in it, called Universal Gravitation Discovery, and turn it over and look at the back, OK? And this is where we took our, our cardboard, and we took our tacks, and we took our string, and I ask you to make some ellipses. And we made a couple different types of ellipses. We can go from a, something that's almost circular to something that is uh, it's almost, almost linear. And those are our ellipses, OK? And, and the reason why we did that is because one of Kepler's laws is that, is that the orbits of the planets um, are elliptical. The orbits of the planets are elliptical. So this is one of the things, uh, and, and again, how did, how did Kepler come up with this? Brahe took a lot of data. Kepler helped him take that data. And with that information, he was able to uh, discern that the, the planets were going around the sun, and not in a circular pattern, okay? Not just going around the sun in a circular pattern, but yet it was elliptical, okay? And what's kind of cool about that is, is that, like we said there in the uh, second ellipse that I asked you to draw, the orbit, the orbit of the Earth and the other planets is elliptical, but really close to being circular. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw a star to represent our sun, because our sun is a star. And we're going to draw another point pretty close to that star. And that's a foci of our ellipse. 
Now, out in outer space, there's nothing there, okay? Let's draw the ellipse. There's the orbit of the Earth, let's say, okay? Or the orbit of Mars. Or the orbit of, as we drew here, see? There's the orbit of Mercury, just like we had uh, on our, on our uh, polar graph paper the other day. You can see that the center is one of the ellipses, one of the foci of the ellipse. One of the things that I think is important for you to understand is that as the Earth goes around here, we, we experience different seasons. You know, when the Earth goes around the sun one time every year. And so let's draw our Earth over here, and let's draw our Earth over here, okay? Which one of the two um, <clears throat> is the middle of winter? The one on the right. Now, a lot of people think it's the one on the right, but it's not. This one, for the northern hemisphere, okay? For the northern hemisphere, this is winter when we're actually closer to the sun. Then why is it winter if we're closer to the sun? Anybody know? Because we're tilted. We're tilted away. Very good. So we're tilted away from the sun. Remember, the Earth is not straight up and down. The North Pole and the South Pole are not straight up and down. There's, a, there's, a, there's an angle of tilt to it. It's going to be something you're going to look at on your worksheet. In the summertime, even though we're a little bit further away, where the Northern Hemisphere is pointed towards the sun, and so therefore we have uh, warmer temperatures, even though we're just a little bit further away. On the average, the Earth's about 93 million miles away from the sun. But in any given day, it's going to be somewhere a little bit more or a little bit less than that, depending upon what time of the year it is. Right now it's fall, OK? And so here at the, in the fall, you can see that we're going from summer to winter, all right? Moving our, moving our direction around, OK, as, as, as we move around. And, and we're, we're pretty much, uh, you know, in, the, in what I think is the really nice time of the year as far as temperatures are concerned. And it, is, it does depend upon how we're pointing towards the Earth or towards the sun. Now I'd like for you to take the, um, uh, the back of the other discovery. And we're going to talk about the polar graph paper uh, activity that we did. So take a look at the back of the other discovery. And, and we take a look at what we showed, what I showed you here with Mercury, again, an, an elliptical formation. And, and one of the things that, that Kepler was able to discern from the data was he was trying to look and see how fast the planets went around the sun. Now, what, what we now know, what we now know to be true, is that the sun, right here in, in the, in, on the foci of our ellipse, is a great, big, massive gravitational force. Okay? So the sun has a very, very, very large gravitational force. And so that's why all of the planets stay in orbit, because they're attracted to the, to the sun. And they stay in this orbit because they're moving around. We think about Newton's first law, inertia, a body in motion stays in motion. So the planets stay in that motion, moving around, okay? And that's what keeps them in their in, in, their, in their orbits, okay? So when the, when the planet gets closer to the sun, when it is over here in the wintertime, it's closer to that big gravitational force, and it actually makes it move a little bit faster, okay? So when we're closer to the sun, we actually travel around the sun faster. Now, 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 make sure you understand. We're not spinning around faster. The days don't go faster, okay? <laughs> that's, that's, that's our spinning around. It tells us how many hours in a day. But we're actually moving uh, uh, faster around the, the, in our orbit. So in the summertime, we're slower. And that's all due to the gravitational force of the sun. So what Kepler tried to think about, he said, well, well then how is it then that we can relate how can we relate then the speed and, and where we're at, okay? And so what he did was he, he looked at the uh, graphs and he looked at the charts, very similar to what I asked you to do on the polar graph paper. And he said, well, if I travel 10 days and get this motion like this in the wintertime, and then I travel 10 days in the summertime, we can see that he's traveling more, traveling faster in the winter, 
traveling less in the summer, traveling slower. But what, what Kepler discerned from this, what Kepler figured out mathematically, he was a pretty, pretty cool genius mathematically, was that they're not going an equal distance in, an, in the same amount of time. These are both representative of 10 days, just like on your polar graph paper. But what they're doing is they're sweeping out equal area in equal time. So let's write that down. Kepler's second law, sweep equal area in equal time. So they don't travel the same distance, but because they're further away, the area of that little piece of pie, OK? And again, a whole up mix. Good, good, couple good pieces of pie here, right? This is kind of a short, fat piece of pie and a long, thin piece of pie. But the area of those two pieces of pie are equal to each other. So let's look at our calculations. And some of you had a, a little bit of a difficult time with the calculations. The radius, like for instance on the first one in number 13, should be between 0 0.309 and 0 0.327. So it should be about 0.318. And then the, the angle that we covered in that time was 61 degrees, because on the 20th we were at 65, and on the 30th we were at 126. And when we plug that in, 61 divided by 360 times pi times the radius squared, we get about 0.05. Okay? So if you didn't get that, write that down, if you would, please. The area for number 13 should be about 0.05. The area for number 14 should be about 0.05 also. Even though our radius was different, our angles were different, but it still comes out to be mathematically the same. Because the average radius was greater, and the angle that we traveled, the, the distance we traveled, was less. But mathematically, they turned out to be exactly the same. Pretty cool, in my opinion, because we're talking about four centuries ago. Four centuries ago, a guy figured this out. He figured this out without computers, which is kind of a neat thing. Which leads us to his third law, and if you would please, go back to the other discovery, the one called universal gravitation, and look at the front of it. The one with the holes in it, Nathan, right, and, and Josh. Josh was all worried about the paper with the holes in it, so. Look at the front of the one with the holes in it. And what we did here was we graphed some data of the different planets, okay? We graphed the data of some different planets. Now, now, Kepler and Brahe would have had tons and tons and tons of data of the different planets as they moved around when they saw them. And um, what, what they're trying to figure out are things like, how long does it take the Earth to go around the sun? How long does it take the other planets to go around the sun? And then using that information to figure out how far away they are from the sun. Okay? And what they were able to do was what you did here on this paper. And that is, come up with an idea that the period squared is proportional to the radius cubed. The period squared is proportional to the radius cubed. Most of you were able to get that. Some of you didn't. But the straightest line, the straightest line when graphing these two relationships gives us the two things that are linear or proportional to each other, OK? When I draw a graph and the graph is a straight line, that means proportional. That means linear. And we see right away when we did our first graph on this that the period and the radius are not proportional, OK? Because Mercury's the closest. It does take the shortest amount of time to go around. But that's not proportional to how far away Venus is and how, far, how long it takes it to go around, OK? But what Kepler was able to do was to figure out that if you took the period, and the period is defined as the time to go around the sun one time, OK? The period is the time to go around the sun just one time. He found out that the period squared was proportional to the radius cubed. And we're going to call the radius the average <laughs> distance from the sun. OK? The average distance from the sun is the, is the radius. Now, we can use any units we want. If we wanted to stick with pure physics, period would be measured in seconds. 
and radius would be measured in meters. And that'd be a real big pain in the rear end because the numbers would be huge. So instead, what we do is we, as, as Earthlings, we are going to use our own units because we're on Earth. And what we see here, notice on your chart there on the gra universal gravitational study discovery, what is the period of the Earth? Yeah, one year. Okay? And so therefore, we're going to set our period in Earth years. Okay? Earth years. So the Earth goes around the Sun in one year. Mercury goes around the Sun in 0.241 years. In other words, it only takes about a quarter of a year, about three months, for Mercury to go around the Sun. Mercury goes around the Sun four times for every one year that we have. Venus, 0.615 years is the time it takes. 0.615 years, you know, we're talking, uh, oh, I don't, I don't know, we're talking maybe 210, 200 days or so, something like that, okay, for Venus to go around the Sun. How about some of the other planets? Mars, 1.88 years. So it almost takes two years for Mars to go around the Sun. So what about these radiuses? They're in astronomical units. Astronomical units. How did they ever come up with this thing called an astronomical unit? Take a look at Earth and tell me what its value is. Why? So they said, the average distance from the sun for Earth is 93 million miles, but I don't like that big number. I'm just going to say that's one. One astronomical unit. So how far away is the Earth from the sun? One astronomical unit. So we made up our own units to fit our data easily. Okay? So you notice that the planets Mercury and Venus, which are closer to the sun, have values less than one, and everybody's further. Now, all the way up to Pluto, Neptune's 30 times greater distance, and Pluto's 40 times almost, okay? So let's do a little mathematical problem here, okay? And, and even though you already have a lot of data there, I'll go ahead and throw out uh, some new data. Because, you know, the other, about two, was it two years ago, they decided that Pluto was not a planet? Remember that? So I've said they're wrong, and, and that's what I'm sticking with. Pluto's a planet, you know? Because my very educated mother, you've heard that before, right? You know? Uh, pizza. The word at the end is pizza. You know, you got to have pizza, so you got to have the P there. So we're not throwing Pluto out. In fact, um, uh, this is a true story, Jordan. Since Jordan's not here, we'll, we'll tell her on tape. Jordan, this is a true story. Um, they've discovered a new planet outside of Pluto. Okay? Have you heard about this, guys? They're going to call it Goofy. It's just another Disney character. They thought they, you know, they made the last one after a Disney character, so they, so they, they got a new one out there. Okay? It takes. It takes um, <clears throat> 300 years, okay? It takes 300 years for Goofy to go around the sun, all right? What I'm going to do now is I'm going to calculate the radius of that, the radius of that. So what I have for you is a formula which relates this period and radius and how they're proportional to each other, all right? And that formula is right here. Here's what this formula is. P1 squared over R1 cubed is equal to P2 squared over R2 cubed. Pretty simple little formula, actually. We just got to make sure that we cube and square the right things. Okay? Now, now, we can pick any planet we want to be planet number one. Okay? So this side right here, this is planet number one, whatever we want it to be, okay? And this will be planet number two, which we're going to say, in this case, is Goofy, okay? We can pick any planet we want to be number one, and it will mathematically work out. But I'm going to choose my favorite planet. Earth, good idea. And the reason why I chose Earth is because the period of Earth is what? One. One. And 1 squared is 1. Love that. What's the radius of Earth? 1. And 1 cubed is? 1. See, this is so wonderful. See, if you count, you need a calculator. So, so the bottom line is, is that this whole left side of the equation is equal to 1 if we choose Earth. And we choose years and astronomical units as our units of measure. So if that's equal to then the period 
square, look at your answer, look at the data for the other planets, does it make sense? If Pluto is the furthest one we know now and Goofy's outside of it, does your answer make it outside of it? Now, two different ways to solve this mathematically. The answer is 44.8, by the way. 44.8 astronomical units, which would be 44.8 times further than the Earth is away from the sun. Two ways to do this on your calculator. If you take and square your 300, of course, you get 90,000. And then to take the cube root of that, if you don't have a cube root button, you can either take x to the negative 3 power or use a pair sign. There are a variety of different ways. If you don't know how to do it, let me know and I'll help you. Okay. One of the cool things then about Kepler's three laws is that Kepler's three laws were then used by Sir Isaac Newton in conjunction with his laws. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to look then at the fourth and final discovery activity that I asked you to do. The inverse square law, okay, the one where you went to the to the computer with the uh, uh, force sensor. Take a look at that one for just a second. And we want to take a look and see what did Newton do when he used Kepler's laws, okay? Uh, what did Newton do and, and, and how did he figure that out? Well, what I wanted to do with the discovery activity was to take a look at a graph of the force that was being applied by the magnet to the other magnet, and then how did that change when we put them different distances apart, okay? And what we see here is a graph that looks kind of like this, okay? Hopefully everybody has that other graph. And then I said, graph out for me a directly proportional line. Okay, you did that, and we've got this right here. Graph out for me an inversely proportional line. And you do that, and you get something that's kind of like that. And then when you graph something that is inversely proportional to the x-axis squared, then we get what our graph looks like. And the reason why I wanted to do this, and to do this activity, was to show you that no matter what kind of force we're talking about, whether it's the force of magnets or the force of gravity, which is what Newton and Kepler were talking about, the force is proportional to the inverse of the distance squared. Or we could say that the force is inversely proportional to the distance squared. Okay? This is what we call in physics the inverse square law. Okay? That when you move further away from something, the force of attraction will go down. But it doesn't just go down proportionally. Like if I moved twice as far away from the Earth, my force of attraction wouldn't cut in half. My force of attraction would actually cut by one-fourth, okay? If I moved three times as far away from the Earth, my force of attraction would cut down by a factor of nine. Three squared is nine, okay? This inverse square law, pretty important little idea in physics, real important idea in physics, because as you saw on the discovery, it works with magnets. One of the things we're going to do later, too, is we're going to take a look at when we start talking about electricity, we're going to look at electrons and how they move. Force and distance inversely proportional to each other. Pretty cool, huh? Look at this one. This one has to do with light. The illumination of light and the distance it is a part squared. Pretty cool. So the inverse square law, pretty important idea. Okay? Kepler and used, Kepler, excuse me, Kepler's laws helped Newton come to this conclusion. And so here's what Newton came up with when, when he did this. He said, well, I'm going to take and determine the force of attraction between two bodies. Now, when I use the word bodies, I could be talking about a variety of things. I could be talking about your body and the attraction to another person, okay? Because actually, we all have gravitational forces, and we're all attracted to each other gravitationally, even though maybe not other ways. Or we could be talking about heavenly bodies, like the Earth and the Sun. Okay? So we got all kinds of different things, all different sizes and stuff. And what, what he came up with was, he said, you know what? If, if I've got bigger and bigger and bigger objects, 
there's actually a lot more force involved in these, in these objects. So he said that the, I put equals, my fault. I'm going to put proportional. The mass of the objects times the mass of the object, got two different objects, okay, is proportional to the force. So he says, you know, if I've got two big things, their force of attraction is greater than two smaller things. Well, that kind of makes sense. Because what we understand about gravity is that the bigger the object, the bigger the object, the more gravitational force there is. Okay? Um, and so Newton has these two ideas that he wants to put together. Force is inversely proportional to the distance squared, and force goes up when mass goes up. So here's what he did. He said, well, that means that force would be equal to mass of one object times the mass of the other object divided by the distance squared. But the problem is the numbers didn't mathematically work out. So I make reference back to something we studied back in chemistry one, and that's our good old pervert equation. And in the pervert equation, we talked about how the pressure and the volume were proportional to the number of moles and the temperature. But it didn't mathematically work out. So we had to have a constant, a number that we multiply to make it all work out mathematically. And that's what Isaac, Sir Isaac Newton put into his formula. He put into this formula big G. And big G is called the universal gravitation constant. And its whole purpose is to make the masses multiplied together, divided by the distance that they are apart, squared, mathematically work out to be the force in newtons. So the masses are measured in kilograms, the distances are measured in meters, the forces are measured in newtons, and big G is 6.66 times 10 to the negative 11. Big G, 6.67, excuse me, times 10 to the negative 11. Now, what kind of units would we have to have on this in order to make it work out? Well, we want to end up with newtons. We want to get rid of, since we're multiplying by mass, we want to get rid of kilograms. And we want to, and we want to make sure that we have our meters gotten rid of also. So the units are kind of crazy looking, but that's the units that we have for this particular formula. And that formula is right up here on the wall. And this formula works for all kinds of things, okay? We could take the mass of, of two different planets and put them in, and we could determine how far apart those planets are and see how much force there is between them. We could take the distance that the moon is apart, the mass of the Earth and the mass of the moon, and determine what kind of force there is between them. Or we could take Zane's mass and Jeremy's mass and how far apart they are and calculate the gravitational attraction between Zane and Jeremy. So, so we can do this on all scales, on all levels. So I think that that's pretty cool. Now, when we take this idea then to the next step, there's a, a scientist by the name of Cavendish who did some really cool experimentation that happened to help Sir Isaac Newton. And when, when he did this experimentation, then Isaac Newton was able to then take this formula and come up with some pretty cool stuff. For instance, he was able to calculate the mass of the Earth. Let me show you what I mean. Okay? Um, if I take uh, Sir Isaac Newton's basic equation, F equals MA, okay? And I write down Sir Isaac Newton's new equation, F equals G M1 M2 all over D squared. We use a very simple basic math idea that if f is equal to this, if f is equal to that, then this is equal to that. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand here on the earth. Okay? There's earth. There's Mr. C. There I am. Okay. And we're going to calculate um, some things based upon the, the acceleration due to gravity and, and, and how far I am, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So what I want to do now is I want to take this and set it equal to that. Okay? I want to take this and set it equal to that. 
Now what is this? This is F equals MA. And for me, standing on Earth, this would be my mass times the acceleration due to gravity. Now, little g has been a, a topic of discussion in the past week a little bit because little g is 9.8 meters per second squared on Earth. That is the acceleration due to gravity on Earth, and we use the lowercase little g to represent that value. But that's my acceleration, okay? That's also my weight, if you will, okay? I'm going to label that as m2, and I'm going to make m1 be the mass of the Earth, okay? And so what we can come up with then is the fact that the acceleration due to gravity, see that's an acceleration, so that's my little g, is equal to the universal gravitational constant times the mass of whatever planet we want to talk about. I'll make that a big M for the mass of this big planet, divided by the distance that the planet and I am apart. Well, how far away am I from Earth? And you might say zero, because I'm standing on Earth, but that's not right. Because what I need to make sure that you understand is that Earth's gravitational field is at the center of the Earth. And the distance that I am away from the center of the Earth is the radius of the Earth. And so therefore, <coughs> I can say that the distance that I am apart from the Earth is the radius of the Earth. Okay? Not zero, because that, that wouldn't work out anything mathematically, would it? So what Sir Isaac Newton was able to do was he was able to use this idea to calculate the mass of the Earth because he could use simple mathematics to, to look at the horizon, to look at the angle, to determine, well, if the Earth is spherical and this is the curvature of the Earth, what's the radius of the Earth? That's some pretty simple mathematics for him. And so he was able to derive this formula to derive the um, uh, uh, mass of the Earth. Because we already know that the acceleration due to, due to gravity is 9.8 here on Earth. What was he able to do then with some other planets? Well, with other planets, if we can use the same composition, the same basic density, uh, uh, of, of the planet, if we, can, if we can approximate the densities of it, which we can by using spectral photometry and determining what kind of elements are on that planet, we can, we can approximate their mass, we can really measure their radius as to how big they are, and we can determine the acceleration due to gravities on other planets. And one of the things we find out to be true is, is that, well, we've already talked about the moon, right? The moon, which is smaller than the Earth, has an acceleration due to gravity that's smaller than the Earth. Okay? It's only 1.62. But if we were to go to Jupiter, for instance, Jupiter is huge. It is huge. And so, so it has an acceleration due to gravity that's like 40 times that of Earth. Or 4 times that of Earth. Excuse me. 4 times that of Earth. It's about 40. Instead of 9.8, it's about 40. Wow. That's really big. Imagine that, that how hard it is to walk on Earth. It would be 4 times harder to walk. If I jump up in the air one foot, I'd only jump about three inches on Jupiter because it's four times more gravity. That'd be, that'd be, that'd be, we'd develop a lot of really strong muscles, wouldn't we? Now, the, the, the interesting thing to me about this is, is how we can then apply this to our other planets and then apply it to other things. And so far, this is, this is basically been really, really good stuff that's worked out for us mathematically and, and, and in our science. Now, one of the neat things then about this is, as we look at this formula, and we think about g as being the acceleration due to gravity, if we were to move further away from the Earth, then what happens then to our acceleration due to gravity? Okay? So here I am on the Earth. Then I'm some radius away from the Earth. I know the mass of the Earth. I know the big g, because that's a constant. And what about if I'm out here? Okay? You know, maybe a few miles above the Earth, or a few thousand kilometers above the Earth, or whatever. Okay? What about if I'm way out there? Well, my radius goes way, 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 way up. That means that my acceleration due to gravity goes way, 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 way down. Okay? So the further I get away from the Earth, the less I'm attracted to the Earth. Well, that, I think, makes sense, you know? 
And, and what we're going to do is eventually we're going to become what we would call weightless. Okay? And I've kind of talked about this before a little bit. You know you can't become massless because your mass is your mass no matter where you're at, whether you're on Earth or on the moon, your mass is your mass and you're measured in kilograms. But your weight is a force due to gravity. Your weight is a force due to gravity. And so therefore, here on Earth, here on the surface of the Earth, you have a particular weight, which is your mass times 9.8, if you were to go closer to the Earth, like down into a really, really deep tunnel, okay, you're, you, become, uh, you, you become heavier, your mass stays the same, but your weight increases, and as you go further away, you become more and more and more weightless. Now, has, uh, has anyone ever experienced weightlessness in here before? Nope. Josh has. A little bit. How'd you do it? Well, plane landing. Mm -hmm. Plane coming down, it gives you a little bit of weightlessness, yeah. How about on the, uh, it used to be down at, down at Kentucky Kingdom, they called it the Helivator, but now it's the, um, uh, over at um, uh, the Liberty Launch at uh, Hollywood. Thank you very much. Liberty Launch at Hollywood. You, you get, oh, Hannah shaking her head, no. Oh, it's a great ride, Hannah, come on. You go up in the air, and then it accelerates down faster than 9.8, or at the same rate as 9.8. And so what you're doing is, you're riding in the ride, and the ride is accelerating at 9.8. You're on Earth, uh, you're accelerating at 9.8. And so therefore, consider the frame of reference of the ride. You have no acceleration. You have no force. You have no weight. You're weightless. And of course, what do you do when you go down on that ride? Besides hand, the rest of you have done it, right? Yeah, that's cool. Because you kind of just float there, don't you? Okay, you're kind of in your seat. You're kind of sitting up. And that's the idea of weightlessness. We can't be massless, but we can be weightless. In other words, we're, we're, we can be far, far, far away from the Earth and not have any acceleration towards the Earth because gravity's so little. Or we could be moving down towards the Earth, as Josh indicated, in an airplane that's accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, Josh, do you know the name of the airplane that the government uses to train their astronauts and pilots in that? It's called the Vomit Comet. Yes, it's called the Vomit Comet because a lot of people vomit in it. <laughs> obviously, but NASA has a great big huge airplane, and they take it way high up in the air, and then they bring it and they nosedive straight down, and they're accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared. Well, everybody inside all of a sudden becomes weightless. They can float around just like you can in outer space, because they're accelerating towards the Earth at 9.8. The plane is accelerating at 9.8. So in their frame of reference, in their airplane, they have no acceleration. They have no weight. I'm going to show you a little demonstration to help you see this. What I've got here is a plastic bottle, and I've cut two holes in the bottom, okay? I'm going to cover those holes with my fingers, and I'm going to fill this up with water, okay? And I want you to notice here that, uh, all right, I'll try to hold it nice. It'll leak a little bit, but not too bad. So I'm just going to take this, and I'm going to hold it here, and I'm not going to allow the container to go down, but I'm going to remove my hand, and you can see the water comes out. You're probably not surprised. Gravity is, is affecting the water, so the water is, is coming out, okay? Now this time, I'm going to take this object, and I'm going to drop it from the ceiling. And the bottle will accelerate towards the Earth at? 9.8. The water will accelerate towards the Earth at? 9.8. So what's the water going to do? Watch carefully to the water. Watch the water. Don't worry about the bottle, but watch the water. It didn't come out. Did you see that? The water didn't come running out. The water didn't come out because the water was accelerating at 9.8. The container was 9.8. This is just like the vomit comet on a smaller scale. The contents of the container are accelerating at the same rate, so there's no additional force. So the water was weightless, and it stayed inside the container. Okay? All right, clean that up for me, other place. So, uh, just kidding. So, this is, allows us to hopefully understand a little bit about what's going on out in outer space. And it allows us, I think, to see that one of the really, really cool things about physics, okay? And this may, who knows, it may get disproven in your lifetime. And who knows about the string theory and all these other things about, about what we might discover in your lifetime. 
But right now, what do we know of in physics that we apply here on Earth are applied in, 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 in outer space and they're applied in other planets. And, and of course, there are exceptions with things we call the theory of relativity we'll get to later on later in the year and, and those kinds of things. But, but when we look at these simple basic tenets of what's happening here on Earth, F equals MA, we can apply that to planets also. And as I said, later on in the year, we're going to take this formula here and use it with electrons and look at and look at see how some of the smallest things that we know about behave exactly the same as some of the biggest things that we know about. And that's pretty cool physics in my book. Okay? Any general questions? All right, that's what I've got. You know your homework for the weekend. <laughs>